I'm excited to talk to you today about celiac disease, a can't-miss diagnosis that every clinician needs to know about. I'm Dr. Amy Oxentenko, Professor of Medicine and Gastroenterologist at Mayo Clinic, and I'm excited today to tell you about an upcoming review we have in Mayo Clinic Proceedings that I co-authored with Dr. Rubio Tapia. The title of our article is Celiac Disease and will occur in the December 2019 edition of Mayo Clinic Proceedings. So let me just tell you a little bit of background about celiac disease. We know this is a really common entity, can affect up to 1% of the population. And this really occurs, and it's a multi-system immune-mediated disorder, which occurs in genetically susceptible individuals when they ingest gluten. This is a diagnosis that's most commonly made in patients in their mid-30s. But it's really important to remember that about 20% of our patients with celiac disease are diagnosed at age 60 or beyond. So this is a diagnosis that it can occur at all ages and present with a variety of manifestations. So in the past, we used to talk about celiac disease in terms of typical and atypical symptoms, but we have really converted our nomenclature. And now we talk about symptoms of classic celiac disease. And by that, we mean the symptoms that we most often think about, such as diarrhea, weight loss, bloating, et cetera, any of those typical GI manifestations. However, we used to call the more uncommon conditions or manifestations as atypical, but that nomenclature has changed that we now call those non-classical. And the reason for that change is now those non-classical features are some of the most common that present to the clinician. The one we should think about most commonly is iron deficiency anemia. That's the one that probably presents most commonly to the clinician. Other things to think about are those patients with premature metabolic bone disease, such as osteopenia and osteomalacia, at an age or without risk factors beyond what you would expect. Patients can also present with abnormal liver biochemistries with no other explanation. So that's a, an important thing to keep in your differential when you're working up those patients. Other things would be the itchy rash of dermatitis herpetiformis, which is a clear manifestation of celiac disease. And roughly 20% or so of patients can actually have constipation at the presentation with celiac disease. So again, that's very different than what we used to think about in terms of patients presenting with features of diarrhea and malabsorption. So how do we make a diagnosis of celiac disease? Well, in current day, we have really great serology which have high sensitivity and high specificity. So in a patient who you're wanting to evaluate for celiac disease, the serologic test of choice is the IgA tissue transglutaminase antibody. And typically what we would recommend is also checking a serum immunoglobulin IgA level in addition, because there's roughly three to 5% of the celiac population that might be IgA deficient. So that will allow you to not miss those patients who might be IgA deficient. Now there are other serologic studies that you can, you can choose and that are available but guidelines really suggest against using panel testing, meaning doing a shotgun approach and ordering more than one serology just to increase the yield. So while that can improve the sensitivity if you do more testing, that will decrease the specificity, meaning you're going to have more false positives and put patients through unnecessary workup. The other thing that all adult patients should undergo if they have a positive serology or if they have a really high clinical suspicion for the disorder despite a negative serology is they should all undergo an EGD with small bowel biopsies. Now this differs from the pediatric guidelines which can suggest you can make a diagnosis just based on serologic findings alone, but we really have not fully embraced that yet in the adult population and still recommend an EGD with small bowel biopsies. The really important caveat before you embark on any kind of diagnostic workup to work someone up for celiac disease with either serology or histology is to make sure they're on a gluten-containing diet before you do that testing. Once a patient has gone on a gluten-free diet, the sensitivity of both the serology and the histology will decrease significantly. Some patients will ask about the genetic test for celiac disease and how does that fit into your you know, armamentarium in your clinic and how do you work, uh, work up a patient with those genetic testing. So we typically do not re recommend the permissive haplotyping in all patients. So we know that all patients with celiac disease either have HLA DQ2 or DQ8 positivity. Now the issue is 30 to 40% of the population also has positive HLA DQ2 or DQ8. So how this test can be helpful is let's say you're seeing a patient who is already on a gluten-free diet 
and has not undergone a workup for celiac disease, but maybe ought to based on clinical suspicion or other features. So that is a patient you might think about checking their HLA DQ2 or DQ8 and see if they have one of these permissive genes. If they don't, then you can feel very confident telling that patient they don't have celiac disease and their choice to avoid gluten or consume gluten is really up to them. Now a positive test, meaning if your patient has a permissive gene, that does not mean they have celiac disease. That just means in that patient, you really should then put them through a formal gluten challenge to really decipher whether they have celiac disease or not. So once we've made a diagnosis of celiac disease, how do we manage these patients? Well, unfortunately, the management for this has not changed over time. It is still lifelong and strict avoidance of wheat, rye, and barley. So this is a really big change for patients. They have to learn how to read labels. They have to be very astute when eating out at social occasions or at restaurants. So this is a really big deal, and it's a really significant change of their lifestyle. So we can't expect them to do this alone or with the use of internet. All of these patients should be referred to a very skilled dietitian who's well-versed in a gluten-free diet. Any adult patients with newly diagnosed celiac disease ought to have a bone mineral density to assess their, assess their bone health. Probably reasonable to check some baseline labs, including vitamin and mineral levels, to make sure they're not deplete and need replacement of those as well. Once we've made the diagnosis of celiac disease and put someone on their initial therapy on a gluten-free diet, what do we need to do for follow-up of that patient? And follow-up is really critical. So typically we will check in with those patients at about a three to six month range, see how they're doing clinically. And most of these patients will have pretty dramatic improvement of their clinical symptoms in that short of period of time. We also will often recheck the initial serology that was positive at that three to six month mark. And we would suspect a significant decrease in that serologic titer, if not to a normalized level at that period of time. If any of the initial labs, meaning vitamin and mineral levels, were abnormal at the onset, we will also recheck those at that three to six month mark to see if our replacement has been adequate as well. Now the question comes in, do you need to rebiopsy these patients? And if so, when do you do it? It can take a fair amount of time for the small bowel to heal itself, and probably no sooner than one year would you ever want to rebiopsy someone's small bowel to assess for healing. But what we typically do in our practice and recommend is to wait to repeat a small bowel biopsy until that patient is at the two-year mark. Finally, what happens to the patient who comes back to you who either has not improved at all on their gluten-free diet or has recurrent symptoms? And again, this is not uncommon in clinical practice. The first thing you need to do first and foremost is to really review their diet. It is most likely that they are getting gluten in their diet either you know, blatantly or inadvertently through cross-contamination. So this is a really important thing to, again, review the gluten-free diet, maybe have them revisit with a dietitian if, if necessary. We know that pure oats are fine and safe for these patients to consume, but there can be cross-contamination of oats, so that would be another area to scrutinize in terms of are they getting contamination in their oat products and that's causing refractory symptoms. Another thing I like to do in that case is review any of their medications, both prescription and over-the-counter. Many of them may contain gluten-containing products that could be fueling their symptoms as well. So once you've removed gluten as a consideration for their ongoing symptoms, then there are other considerations and diagnoses that are associated with celiac disease you need to think about, such as microscopic colitis, carbohydrate malabsorption, um, small, bacteria, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and then just functional bowel disorders such as irritable bowel syndrome. And it's really a very small percentage of population that has true refractory celiac disease meaning the type of patients that may need to be put on immunosuppression to have improvement of their clinical symptoms. So this is just a brief teaser. I'm looking forward to having you read our review in this month's Mayo Clinic Proceedings. So enjoy the article and good luck with these patients. We hope you found this presentation from the content of our website valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you'll find access to information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel, or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter, more information about Healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. 
This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.